Welcome to another episode of Preferred Walk-On, a PFF college football show. I'm your host, Max Chadwick. On the show, we interview some of the biggest superstars in college football. This guy could be one of the top quarterbacks in the 2024 NFL Draft, and that is Duke's Riley Leonard, who actually was the number five quarterback prospect for PFF's lead draft analyst Trevor Sycamore in the 2024 draft. He led all ACC quarterbacks last year with a 1.7% turnover-worthy play rate and also was fifth among Power 5 quarterbacks with 776 rushing yards. As always, check out the feature article that actually dropped today at pff.com on Riley Leonard. And of course, a major, major thank you to Dave Sofaro, who sets up every single one of these interviews, and we've got plenty, plenty more still to come. So make sure you hit that subscribe button. But without further ado, here he is, Duke quarterback Riley Leonard. All right, man, so the first question I want to ask you, this is the big story that's been surrounding you recently. Somehow, you've turned your mom from your biggest supporter into your biggest hater. She gave you a brace that says, quote-unquote, you suck on it. Can you kind of go into that and explain that a little bit? Yeah, so growing up uh, in, in a small community, I was, I was a really good athlete, and everybody just wanted to give me praise all the time. <laughs> uh, you know, I ended up making football, varsity, and basketball as a true freshman, so... <laughs> in high school i was always getting this praise and I, I was just so sick of it i was i needed somebody to bash me give me some criticism you know kind of just wake me up um so my mom raised her hand she's like dude i'll do it i'll do it before every game so ever since then in high school and, and on into college before every game she'll send me a you suck text or before an interview uh hey don't suck at this interview uh it kind of just brings me back down to reality and she's not the best at it because she's Obviously, my mom and the sweetest person ever, but it's a little tradition we got going, and I think it, you know, it definitely is something I want to keep uh, continue doing. Did she send you a "you suck" text before this interview? Uh, not before this one, but before like the ACC media day, it was like a, "Hey, don't suck, like, don't, <laughs> don't go out there and start stuttering." And stuff like that, so it's it's pretty funny. Dude, I, I, as someone who's had kind of the opposite experience, I was terrible athletes. My mom would always be like, listen, you're not as bad as you think you are. Like, you could you could do something. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that we had a complete opposite experience. My mom trying to be like, listen, yeah, I know you're bad, but I'm going to try to make you feel better. But, uh, yeah, your mom doing the opposite is pretty hilarious. But when did you know, though, man? Obviously, you said, you know, everyone was praising you in high school. When did you know, though, hey, I can make a college football career possible, and I can make maybe an NFL career possible, too? So my recruiting uh, was very late. I, I got recruited for football really after my junior year, and I was really wanting to play basketball after my junior year. I uh, was planning on going and playing in the EYBL, uh, picking up some offers there, and then going to play basketball in college. Well, COVID comes around, EYBL gets canceled. Mm-hmm. So my basketball offers don't necessarily um, come as, as, I, as I wanted them to. My QB coach, David Morris, sent my film to Coach Cutcliffe because he played for him at Ole Miss. And obviously, when Cut offers you a scholarship to a school like this, you don't turn it down. Yeah. That was a pretty, you know, easy decision for me. But as far as, like, knowing that I, I was able to make it, I'm, I'm the, really the type of guy that's never really going to tell myself I've made it yet. So uh, even though people may think, oh, dude, you've you've already made it, this, that, and the other, in my opinion, I haven't really done much. My, my goals are to win AC Championship and make it to the NFL. And if those two things happen – my my next goal is going to win, be to win win the Super Bowl. So <laughs> I'm never really going to get satisfied with any type of or complacent with any anything in my life. Dude, I got to get the scouting report on you as a basketball player. What kind of player were you uh, in high school? Yeah. So <laughs> I was more of a slasher my senior year. Kind of bulked up a little bit for football. Uh, lost my touch. <laughs> <laughs> definitely lost my touch around the three point uh, three point line. But yeah, I was definitely a slasher. That I was just going to get after it. I love that, man. So like you mentioned before, you were recruited late in the process coming out of Alabama. Did you kind of feel underrated in, in that whole recruiting process? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't know. If, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I never took an unofficial or official visit to any single school. Uh, came up here blindly. Uh, all my offers, I'd never been to their schools before. So, uh, yeah, I, I definitely felt like I was overlooked for sure. So what made you choose Duke over schools like Ole Miss and Nebraska that offered you too? Yeah, so great question. Those those were the couple of schools that I was negotiating. I, I just think you can't fail when you come to a school like Duke. Uh, I know it's kind of cliche to say, but 
worst case scenario, you graduate and you're going to get a great job. So, yeah. <laughs> that's kind of why I picked it. I love that, man. Uh, yeah, I talked to Grant Barton too, and he was like, "Man, I came on campus here, and I was like, this is the most beautiful campus I've ever seen. I'm not, I'm not leaving here." So, yeah, you you picked a good school in Duke for sure, man. But obviously, your freshman year, as most freshmen spend, was as a backup. What did you try to learn in your one year behind Gunnar Holmberg? Yeah, the the biggest thing I took from Gunnar was how he responded uh, after negative situations. I'm a guy that's so competitive that I I, I think I used to. He had a little bit overwhelmed and, and things like that um, and didn't keep my composure as well as I probably should have. But Gunnar really taught me that, like, everybody's watching you, so you better respond um, and, and you, you better be on your best character after a turnover. You better know who to talk to when you go over to the sideline. Um, those types of things are, are the biggest takeaways I took from Gunnar. Absolutely, man. How ready did you feel going into your sophomore year for that starting job? I mean, I got the job a couple weeks before the first game, so I'd be lying to you if I said I was completely ready. I mean, I started one game true freshman year, and it was just a complete disaster. <laughs> so I had a bad taste in my mouth. I had no idea how good um, of a season we were going to have as a team. Obviously, when you go out there first game, what gives me the most confidence is your defense shuts out a team like Temple to zero points. Mm -hmm. That's what's really going to get me going. So, yeah, that's yeah, <laughs> I definitely was not completely prepared for last year. So, man, I know you're a pretty humble guy, but I'm just saying Duke was 3-9 and nine when you were the backup quarterback. They went to 9-4 and four when you became the starter. I don't want to say it was all because of you, but what do you think clicked for the Blue Devils last year? Uh, I, th I think we started to believe that we can win. The year before, we, we went through the offseason, and we had the same personnel, maybe even more talented, but nobody really thought we were going to win. We went into every game, I think, a little bit hesitant. Um, obviously we knew the game plan, things like that, but there was still a doubt but last year, Elko came in his first interview, whenever he hopped off the jet, came straight to our facility and preached, we are winning now. He's not bringing in guys from the transfer portal. He's not waiting a couple years saying, hold on, let me get this thing going. And he said, we're winning now with the backups from the year before. And, uh, you know, once you hear that over and over again, you start to believe it. Hell yeah, dude. So I'm, I was going to bring up Coach Elko, too. Obviously, coming in his first year, your first year as a starter, what was your relationship like as a first-year starting quarterback in college football with a, uh, a first-year head coach at Duke? Yeah, it was really easy for me to get along with Coach Elko. I, I think he's a real player's coach, meaning if there's something he doesn't care about, he's going to let us make the decision on it, whether it's food options at the training table, where we eat, what we wear during the games. That type of stuff. Some guys have an ego um, with, but Coach Elko, he's like, dude, I don't care. I don't want to think about it. You guys make the decision. So that's what I really like about Coach Elko. And uh, he kind of knew I was in that leadership role after last year. So he came to me um, if, if he had a question about the team and stuff like that. So uh, it, it was really easy to, to get to know him and, and be able to play for him. So, Matt, I think one person who loves the getting able to being able to eat whatever they want is your left tackle, Graham Bart, who we consider to be one of the best offensive tackles in college football. What is your relationship like with Graham? Yeah, me and Graham are really, really close. Um, so I took him down to my youth camp that I hosted this summer, and he just killed it. I mean, he's great with the great with the kids. We were able to hang out, go to the beach, go play some golf. And then, you know, every day uh, we're hanging out, whether it's you know, just playing video games or going fishing, going golfing, like I said. Uh, he, he's just an insane guy. Uh, and then on the field, I mean, there's no better thing to have than, than a great left tackle um, blocking for you. He's, uh, he's a great guy. Always got a smile on his face. But I will say, like, he's the most serious about football on the team. He's going to get after it every single day at practice. I mean, oh, I Go ahead, I, I, yeah, I've talked to him about this camp coming up, and not many people look forward to it. <laughs> But he's like ready to go, so it's it's good to hear from me. I love that, man. You know, I actually brought you up, and he's like, "Yeah, I went to his camp," and he's like, "I love talking about him." But man, all I've been doing is talking about Riley Leonard lately. He <laughs> kind of like rolled his eyes in a joking way, but yeah, man, he's awesome. But what do you think, man? As as a player, at least, obviously, you guys have an amazing relationship off the field. As a player, what do you think makes Graham so special? Yeah, it's a great question. I think every decision that he makes is strictly for one one goal um and we all know what that goal is so every every single f piece of food he eats every weight that he lifts is strictly to 
um, get to where he wants to go. I, I think he's so detail oriented and uh, he has a great mindset of delayed gratification. So I, I think that's really what gets him going. And, and I think that's why he's going to be great. That's awesome. Man. So a question I love asking every single player I talk to is what do you think is the best play that you've made in your career so far for you? I'd say probably that 75 yard touchdown run you had against North Carolina in that big rivalry game. But what would be the play that you would go with? Oh, the best play of my career. Uh, I think that's yet to come. But if I had to choose one, I would go maybe the Mir Hagen's uh, touchdown against Wake Forest that put us up um, late in the fourth quarter. That was that was a pretty big time play by by Mir. What uh, what made that play so special to you? Um, I, I think that the fact that we had talked about them bringing the house all week and. Uh, Obviously, they did that, so I kind of had to get the ball out of my hands a little earlier. And it's just like that was something that me and Coach Johns had worked a lot on and, and watched a lot of film on. So whenever they did that, um, brought the extra defender, I knew I had to beat it. So I kind of had to throw the ball off my back foot and throw it up there to me, and he made it. He made a big-time play. Absolutely, man. So what do you think separates you from other quarterbacks around college football? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I, I think the biggest thing is my competitive nature and my ability to do – whatever the defense gives me in any in any given uh, game. I think if somebody needs me to get four yards of play, I can manage the football, uh, protect the football, and get four yards of play. If we're playing a team where I need to make some plays on, on my legs, I'll do that. Uh, if we need to air it out over the top, I can do that too. So um, I'm going to take what the defense gives me. So whatever that may be, I think I have the capabilities of doing that. I mean, I, I mentioned before, I think your best play so far has been that 75-yard touchdown run. Do you like being classified as like a dual threat quarterback, being able to do whatever you know you can on your with your legs? Yeah, I, I think it is a good trait to be to be marked as that, but my goal is to just be a pocket passer that has the ability to run. Obviously, in, in the NFL, I know you have to be a pocket passer, but I, I think my legs can can just be a perk to that. Absolutely, man. So you mentioned David Cutcliffe before and why you said, man, when he offers you, you can't really say no. Uh, one of the big reasons for that, obviously, is his relationship with the Mannings. And I know you actually have a relationship with the Mannings now going to their passing academy and talking with Eli Manning, too. What was that experience like going to the uh, Manning Passing Academy? Yeah, it was unreal. I mean, you got the best quarterbacks in the country all coming in one area. And there are a lot of stereotypes behind some of these guys. But at the end of the day, when we all showed up, we were all just dudes hanging out. And that's kind of what the goal of it was. Peyton and Eli knew every single person by name, um, not even just the college quarterbacks there. All the ball, ball boys and ball girls, um, everybody, they knew who they were. So that really spoke. Um, that, that meant a lot to me. And then just being out there to, and, and throwing with those guys, I was a guy that obviously, like I said, never been to a camp, never went to any throwing camps or anything like that. So I didn't really know where I st uh, stood, but you know, compared to all these guys, but I was able to hang with them. So that gave me a lot of confidence. Um, and, and then just talking with Pey Peyton, he, he he said one night that doing this type these types of things really reminds him of why he plays the game of football. And and you're talking about a guy that has made so much money and is one of the best quarterbacks of all time. And all he wants to do is get out there with little kids and play in the, in the hundred degree weather in Thibodeau, Louisiana. So, you know, the money's not everything. The the status isn't everything. It's just about having fun and loving what you're doing. Dude, that is that is awesome, man. I, I love that. But, you know, speaking of NFL quarterbacks, are there any NFL quarterbacks that you look at and say, you know what, I'm going to try to take stuff from their game and put in my own game? Yeah, so obviously talking with Peyton and Eli, pre-snap, those five to eight seconds pre-snap are extremely important. So we kind of went over what they look at. Uh, so I took that from them. Then Daniel Jones, he's – extremely he's, he's a simple guy but he's very competitive at the same time i think i can re i can relate to that a little bit um he, he told me to keep my life as simple as possible uh that's some of the best advice i've ever gotten because it's so easy to get caught up in so many different things being in the situation i'm in uh josh allen another fiery guy with a big arm not as scared not scared to take a shot um and then tom brady his winning mentality I, I've, I've tried to study how he responds after a loss uh, I, I think that's very important because you can't ever lose confidence and all the guys are, are seeing how you respond. So being able to see how Tom Brady does it, I mean, there's nobody better to, to watch. Absolutely. You mentioned Daniel Jones before, obviously a Duke quarterback that went on to be a, become a first-round pick and now a franchise quarterback for the New York Giants. 
Uh, what is your relationship like with, with Daniel? What kind of advice has he given you as you, you know, begin your journey or have begun your journey as a starting quarterback for the Blue Devils? Yeah, so it, it's a really good relationship. He's been able to come down a couple of times, and we obviously train with the same guy in, in QB country, so that's been really good. He watches every single game, so he'll send me a text, and, and it's just really cool that, you know, we can have a late Saturday game, and he's still watching, even though he has a game on Sunday. So that's pretty cool. Um and as far as advice that he's given me is, like I said, just keep your life as simple as possible and can control what you can control. You can control how you play good ball. And that's all I, I really need to worry about at this time. So, man, Duke's had two first round picks uh, so far in the 2000s. And Lakin Tomlinson and, of course, Daniel Jones, too. We here at PFF and a ton of other people think that you guys might have two this year between you and Graham Barton. Are you kind of focused on joining that club after this year? Uh, Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm really, I really try not to think about it as much as possible. Uh, my goal is just to beat Clemson and, and play good football, like I said, because if I don't, then these conversations aren't even going to be uh, had. So, Dude, I love that. I mentioned to Graham how I put him in like the top 25 of my mock draft. And he goes, man, that's great. I, I just I hate to say it to you. I don't care at all. <laughs> so I was like, man, that's, that's completely fine. Yeah, that's what I talk about a lot. <laughs> that's yeah. the mentality to have, dude, for sure. I think it's an awesome mentality to have, though. But obviously, Duke, man, you guys went 9-4 and four last year. You bring back a ton of starters from that team last year, too. What do you think this team is capable of? Yeah, so I think our strengths right now are, are three things. Number one, our work ethic. You know, we're not going to be the – strongest and fastest guys on every field we're not going to be the five stars that that come in and uh, are just naturally the best athlete on the field but we are going to work outwork everybody and that comes um to our strength coach and our strength program number two we have football intelligence given the school we're at we're all a bunch of smart dudes uh and then number three is you know the preparation that we put in uh every single week I, I think that and, and with the experience that we had last year, I think those are our three things that we really have to focus on. Uh, obviously, being having 17 returning starters, we've been in every situation possible. Uh, we played a lot of big-time games last year, had a lot of close games last year. So uh, that experience is something we're going to have to take and uh, run with. So what should we expect from Riley Leonard in his year two now as a starting quarterback for Duke? Yeah, I think the goal for me is to win football games. Uh, I know that's another political answer, but I can't get caught up in these Heisman-type plays that, that people expect from me. Like I said earlier, my, my job is to get four yards of play and, and put points on the board, whether that's me putting points on the board or my running backs putting points on the board. Whoever it is, uh, I, I think you can expect a winning record and, and a very good one at that. Absolutely, man. So what are you trying to work on this offseason to prepare for, for week two and for year two and, and improve on this year? Yeah, so tangibly is just arm strength, footwork, uh, timing and ball placement, all the little things that, you know, you don't focus on too much. I think mechanically, you know, I'm pretty sharp. Uh, as I just need to improve ball placement, timing and, and rhythm with my guys at receiver. So we've really been focusing on that intangibly has been the leadership part of things and uh, how I handle myself in any given situation. I was able to, you know, become a captain, which is the greatest honor, you know, of my life so far, being that the teammates voted for that. Um, so just focusing on those things, being able to lead the guys, bring energy at practice. I think last year it was more focus on yourself, get the starting job, really just dial in. Now it's how can I get every single person uh, on this team going before every practice. How can I compete and bring the energy energy, and really lead these guys to uh, the right mindset that we want to have going into the year? I love that, man. So a question I love asking, Corey, I mentioned the arm strength before. What is the farthest that you've ever thrown so far in your career? Yeah, I'm not I'm not that guy that's going to launch the ball, uh, <laughs> you know, 80, 90 yards. I, I, I'd say, you know, over 70, but I really don't go out there and just... That's still pretty good, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm around there. Uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, you, I, you, I don't go out there and say how far can I throw the football. It's, that's that's great, man. But you know, you're uh, you're pretty good when you say, yeah, I, I've only hit like 70 yards before. Or it's like, dude, <laughs> that is like double what most people could do, man. So that's still pretty impressive. But a few more questions, man. What is your why? What gets you out of bed every morning? Um, I think I 
have a purpose of affecting people. Um, I, I think I before every every game, I tell myself I'm playing for two things. I'm playing for the man above, and I'm playing for those who can't. I've been in the situation where I was injured and not able to play, and uh, there's no worse feeling than than being vulnerable and not being able to do something for yourself. Uh, I think there are so many kids that want to be in my shoes, and I'm not going to take that for granted. So anytime I don't want to do anything or don't want to get up, I always just remind myself there are millions and millions of kids across the world that would want to be in my shoes right now. How can I get over here and, and start complaining? Uh, that's number one. And then the man above. I mean, every every day I, I lay my head, um, you know, I'm not thinking how, how many touchdowns did I throw? Uh you know what, what what record did i break today it's did i further my relationship with christ did i tr- treat my family with respect that treat my girlfriend with respect um did i better my relationship with my teammates did i help my teammates get to where they want to be i think that's really big for me and a goal of mine is to help everybody get to the nfl um so those types of things are what keep me going it's not hey man that I, I got a chance of making a million dollars if i you know enter the draft this year that stuff, that stuff's just, you know, BS, and and I don't really try to think about it at all. That dude, that's an awesome answer, man. I love that. But when you put on the gold jacket, when you're an NFL Hall of Famer, what will be Riley Leonard's life after football? Yeah, so I'm really excited about that. I think I, I want to be a a great a great dad, uh, <laughs> and and I want to lead people to Christ. Uh, those are two things. I don't want to do it. Um, for the fame or for the money. I don't want to post a video and, and make any money off of it, but uh, I think that that is the most important thing in life. And uh, I just want all my loved ones to be happy at the end of the day. So I think that's the only only way you can really achieve uh, fulfillment. Absolutely, man. So last question I want to ask you, you mentioned before how a lot of kids look up to you. I know you did a camp uh, earlier too. There's a lot of kids, Riley, that look at you and say, that is exactly where I want to be where I, when I grow up. What advice would you give those kids that are trying to, you know, follow in your footsteps? Yeah, one is just trust in the Lord, obviously. And number two, uh, you have to embrace being different. You're going to have to go through high school and college, and you're going to you're going to be faced with peer pressure. Uh, I I just I told them like I promise you, it's not cool to do these things. Everybody that did these things are struggling right now. Like it may be easy in the fun way at the time, but Delayed gratification, like I talk about, is very important. You have to you have to understand your worth, and, and you're worth so much more than going out and partying on a on a Saturday night. So, I, I think it's it's very important to know who you are and stick to tr- stick stick to who you are because there are a lot of people that are going to want to be a lot want going to want you to be a lot of different things. But as long as you say as long as you stay true to who you are, you're going to be all right. Riley, this is an awesome, awesome interview, man. I, I can't wait to see what you have in store this upcoming season. But listen, man, you're you a phenomenal interview. And I, I, like I said before, I can't wait to see what you guys do. I appreciate that. You have a good one. Thank you.